Hello. So the, um, this is a joint work with multiple people, uh, Rene Haster, Taryn Lane, Vince Clark, Mike Weisand, and Vince Calhoun. So if there is something good in my talk, that's probably due to them. And there are, if there are mistakes, that's most likely mine. So uh, this is an outline. Um, I'm, I will talk about connectivity estimation. And um, as most of my language was already introduced by previous speakers, I will talk more about uh, effective connectivity estimation, but in a little weird way of treating it, not what you usually would expect. And I will show you a unimodal example, uh, the connectivity from EEG, and then go into our attempts uh, to do it multimodally. And I apologize to people who heard me talk about it before, because there is not much added. But yeah, so let's talk about uh, definition. OK. Uh, I don't know if I should skip this talk, but uh, uh, the, the slide. Uh, so, but basically, because you you already covered my, uh, the previous speakers covered some, but um, one part wasn't talked much about. Everyone would talk about fMRI because, for various reasons, fMRI machines are widespread uh, in this kind of research. But there are there are other ways to measure the brain, and uh, it's usually ignored that we can uh, get information from various modalities of brain measurement, and uh, they measure different uh, attributes. Uh, for example, fMRI measures blood oxygenation dependent response. So we're getting those 4D data, the volumes uh, as they unfold in time. Uh, the problem, well, the advantages is uh, relatively well localized. Uh, we know these voxels. We know that where the activity is coming from. And if you crank up your Teslas, then you can go to submillimeter level uh, theoretically, or some people don't practically. Disadvantages, it's very slow sampling rate. And because we're measuring blood, it's just if you even increase your sampling rate, it's still very slow. Uh, it's just blood flow. Then uh, there is magnetoencephalography and electroencephalography, which I will show you an example. So the advantage is fairly instant. You're just measuring the electrical activity of those pyramidal neurons in the cortex. But disadvantage, you don't really know where that activity is coming from. Although, uh, it depends on who you talk to. For EMG, uh, the tendency of uh, the tendency is to think that EMG gives you fairly well localized. At least you can get the voxel uh, type localization. But you can argue, uh, you can throw things at me if you disagree. So, uh, well. <laughs> Uh, how deep does it go, MEG? Yeah, yeah, it doesn't go. Um, it, so you're not going to get things like in the base of the angle. You don't. OK, so um, on the human brain mapping a couple of years ago, I was sitting like that in the audience talking to a person and telling that person that, look, MEG doesn't get any subcortical regions. And then the person in front of me turns around and is like, who are you? <laughs> I'm like, so it turns out that was some prominent guy from Europe, Ioannidis, I think the last name, who's done some MEG methodologies to, to get the subcortical. But in practice, no one gets the sub, no one uses MEG for getting subcortical activities. So it's a, it's a arguable. Um, so um, we're assuming that when we're measuring magnetoelectroencephalography and fMRI, we're measuring the same system, the brain. Um, and I, I hope at least at this point we can agree. Uh, so there are, there are, there are neurons uh, who, who do the work. And then we measure some field distribution on the sensors in EMG, or we measure some blood uh, elicited uh, response in fMRI. And so. Uh, Usually, when you talk about fusion of those methods, you talk about lo localization fusion. You're trying to improve localization of electrical uh, um, and magnetoencephalography and electroencephalography. And those are examples which I pulled from internet. If you see a picture from your research, uh, like I'm, I'm just borrowing it. So, uh, uh, like the 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 point of fusion for localization is if we can use fMRI. Or uh, like just to point, and, and even MRI constraint, just to point as to where the activity is likely, and use EMG and EEG to when it has happened, then we, we're good. But what we're trying to do here is a fusion for connectivity. And those are examples which I borrowed from Google Images uh, are of connectivity estimation from EMG and fMRI. And examples that are shown here are functional connectivity. It's basically for EMG, those are. 
Uh, those are um, spectral methods that I'm showing, so-called coherency methods. And for fMRI, this is plain correlation, probably thresholded. Oops, I jumped a slide. OK, yes, so what I will be using solely in that talk is a Bayesian network model. And uh, I hope most of you are familiar. So Bayesian network is this uh, factorization graph of uh, conditional probabilities. That's how you get the joint. And uh, uh, on the right, you see a graph with this 68 or 64, I don't remember exactly, brain regions that come from free surfer atlas. Those are anatomical brain regions, and I will be using them for fMRI results that I'm showing there and for image results. And then there is this conditional distribution that it's that object that could be linear, could be nonlinear. You can model it that way. Uh, but, uh, and here's the difference, beca beca uh, because as it was mentioned in previous talks, like when you have tons of ROIs, how do you interpret it? And so uh, you've mentioned that five is the interpretable number. So I think one number is good. We need to just uh, to be to be able to really interpret it. We just need one number, and uh, so I take the network or a set of networks that I learn, and I use those graph characterization uh, approaches and just interpret the degree, maximum degree, diameter, density. But it's one number for each group, and it's easy to compare and easy to see if there is difference or not. Um, so that's kind of I. It's a. I feel like I'm throwing away the, a lot of information, but at the same time, I'm not going from correlation matrices, which uh, supposedly give me wrong networks. And again, in previous talks, PC, uh, especially what Joe was talking about, that PC and uh, that class of algorithms, they at least give me a correct skeleton. And uh, that's what those metrics are measuring, the connection and its connection and skeletons. Also, I will be talking about out degree, which takes direction into account. So let, let me show you a fresh example that we have done on EEG. The, the, uh, some preview, uh, the example with, uh, with voxels is kind of uh, strange, right? I, I, I disagree that the ROIs are voxels. And then at the same time, the anatomical ROIs are also they're just randomly split. So really, with the brain, the problem is you don't know what an ROI is. And say, if you're talking about EEG, you have just um, electrodes, 64 or 20, depends on or 32 on your system. So what is the region of interest? So for example, this is go, no go task. Uh, basically, the subject is shown an arrow say uh, some color blue that changes the direction. And there are two buttons. If an arrow points right, uh, subject is instructed to, po to press right. If it points left, then um, also th there should be a match. But if an arrow points some direction, but it is a red color different from the original, the subject is supposed to not press the button. So that's why, that's why the task go and stop. So when those are the measurements and corresponding topographies of electrodes that you see there. Are they? Yep. Uh, the blue, the go, the go and no go. So when something is smooth, subject just keeps uh, matching the direction. There is not too much activity in the ERP response. And then if subject, if the if subject supposed to suppress that uh, pressing the button, then there are responses the, that happens at 200. 200 and three, around 300 milliseconds after the arrow appeared. So we take the data and um, do the following. We, we run temporal ICA on this data and uh, get the topographies and their time courses. And after model selection, we get eight topographies uh, that are representative of this data set. And we assume that each topography is our ROI, or an actor, or a node in the graph. And we want to find, find out how they interact, those eight topographies. Because we have multi-subject temporal data, what we do, we chunk this data. We have a sliding window uh, of. Uh, predefined length uh, that is uh, determined by the experiment. We know when there is nothing happening anymore in the ERP. So we slide the window through time and run structure detection algorithm on all of these windows. And our algorithm is based on Markov chain Monte Carlo. So after burn-in period, we have a lot of networks that are likely 
for this data. So we have some statistics. So what happens there, and then we measure, and of course then we throw away all that information in the network and just measure one number, and actually uh, two different number here, uh, clustering coefficient and uh, characteristic path lengths. So clustering coefficient is more about triangles. If you look at the network, uh, you, uh, at a node in the network, you look at how many triangles it forms with its neighbors. And uh, path length is more like a diameter, how fast you can get from one node to another in the, gra in the graph. So uh, what we found here, and this is due to Rene Haster, is that um, traditionally in ERP literature, in EG, it's believed that if you see, you see that peak uh, at 200 milliseconds and then at 300 milliseconds, that where everything, that's where the stuff is happening. And uh, they even got their names, like negative and positive P300. I don't know why it's flipped, but uh, so this is the P300 and N200 uh, responses. But what we see with the graph is that uh, it starts restructuring before and then fin finishes restructuring after at least the go no go differences and at, at first that's at least the phys physiologist it didn't make a sense but then uh, when you show the graph graphs overlaid on the brain uh, they, they, tend, they tend to think, oh, those are, those are activations, because that's what you think about, like, uh, usually when you look at EG and EVG. But when I finally convinced him that, no, those are more about information processing than activations, so then it makes sense. It's, it, the network restructures itself and then kind of shows the activation and then it dies out. So we, we found the differences. We're trying to publish. <coughs> A paper on that, but reviewers don't believe us or just think it's activations versus uh, the, so, but at least that's one result. But then uh, when you're dealing with one modality, with EEG, I can decide on what my ROIs are, right? Uh, okay, EEG, those electrodes run ICA and I don't depend on anyone. I can say this, this is my ROI versus that. But when you work um, with cross modalities, MEG and fMRI, uh, fMRI in this example, then uh, what, I can't do that anymore because if I do ICA on MEG electrodes, um, sensors then, and declare those my ROIs, then in fMRI I don't have that information, uh, at least not straight, straightforwardly. So we, we took, in this experiment, we took same subjects that on different days performed the same experiments and we tried to do everything the same for the subjects. The same experiments, but in different machines, in fMRI machine and EEG machine. And we've tried to do, to match our analysis or pre-processing as much as we can, so we can at least pretend that we have exactly the same ROIs in fMRI and EEG. So the same modalities and then same ROIs, doing inverse processing with M&E, uh, but it's cortical ROIs, so we don't worry too much about uh, inconsistencies that MEG has with depth. And then align sampling rates uh, and quantize for Bayesian um, learning, so we have discrete data. And then basically infer, uh, use the same method that we used before, Markov chain Monte Carlo learning of structure on the 68 ROIs. And then we compare result also using the degree, not degrees, out degrees, basically. So the, this is the oddball task that we were running. And I'm um, showing activations there and then the data that went in. This is basically just the steps that we've done. So th those are the, RO like this thing formed ROIs in the end. Uh, this is the data which we've discretized for all of the subjects. And then oddball data is um, the following. Subject hears a response or some, some sound, and this is a standard sound, the same frequency repeated really frequently. <coughs> and subject is inst instructed to press a button when a different sound is uh, turned on of a particular frequency, it's very identifiable. But from time to time, a novel response comes on, a sound of a third frequency, which the subject not supposed to respond to. So we have three, three conditions, standards, novels, and targets. But standards are so frequent that fMRI just doesn't see them because they just bump the, the baseline, basically. 
so we can see their novels and targets only in this research. So those are the um, connectivity matrices and uh, sort of the most likely graphs. Just talking about 5,000 variables again, I can't make sense of this data. Uh, I, can, I can walk you through some observations that we can make, but it's not too informative. It's just too overwhelming, at least for me, to analyze. So what we're done, it, we've looked at not degree, and this is the out degree. So can, two conditions, novel and target. And this is the degree distribution, the out degree, number of children, basically. So if you look at the novel condition, then fMRI has a tail. There are quite some number of nodes that have a lot of children. So if you're familiar with the network terminology, there are lots of hubs. And then when you consider target distribution, hubs disappear. So another way to think about it is uh, small worldness or information uh, processing efficiency. FMRI network, FMRI modality tells us brain, if you, if you treat uh, FMRI networks as brain network, the ground truth, FMRI tells us, okay, when there is novel condition, the brain is more efficient. It's, it's a small world network in more sense than when it's target. But if you look, it's the same subject doing the same tasks. If you look at MEG, MEG tells you exactly the opposite. It, uh, if you were an MEG person doing this experiment, you would publish a paper with a conclusion one, and if you're an fMRI person, you, your conclusion would be totally opposite. And this is not just about the degree. This is, we also, ah, okay. There are histograms there, believe <laughs> me. So just focus on the arrows. Uh, we, uh, for, for various other metrics, we, we either see the difference in the sense that the distributions would shift different directions, or the difference like here, different distributions wouldn't shift for fMRI, but it would shift for MEG. So um, one way is to say, well, uh, just don't, don't do multimodal. They, those modalities tell us totally different stories. But our, our interpretation of it, we should take this both of the channels of information into account and um, combine like, uh, combined view of what's going on in the brain from different sources. So another, another reason to, to look at the com combined view is the temporal differences in MEG and fMRI. So on, um, like here, you see, result, you see hemodynamic response. And uh, wait, wait, this is MEG, actually. Uh, and this is the hemodynamic response. And focus on the green line and the red line, say. If you, if you look in MEG on the milliseconds, level, then the green comes first and the red comes after. If you focus on uh, fMRI, then the red comes first. Well, like there is some difference in the beginning, but it may easily get in the, lost, uh, in the noise, get lost in the noise. So the, the reason to look at both or combine both, mod uh, both modalities for this causal or influ influence detection is here. Because if you look at one, one modality, you make one conclusion about the arrow, direction of arrow, or if you look at another, you make another conclusion. And also there is temporal inverse problem in uh, fMRI, which it, the spatial inverse problem in EEG and EMG is well known. People talk about it, but it's not being talked about that in fMRI if you really interpret it as an effect of neural activity and you want to get back to the neural activity. You have about seven parameters to fit, and uh, including the neural activity activation. So you can fit anything you want, and your activity will be at any location that you want within the, like, because the parameters are unknown. Uh, the, this is the preliminary results that we didn't yet uh, pursue further. So what we've tried to do by com uh, for combining MEG and fMRI, we have a hidden activity, which is neural activity. and we used dynamic Bayesian model, but with one hidden ROI in this example. So we have transition, and we have forward model for MEG, and forward model, which is a hemodynamic forward model for fMRI, and our goal from to invert this model to detect what's happening in the inside of the ROI through the forward models. And if you're familiar with Kalman filter and 
models like that. This is a type of the model that we're using. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm doing on time. So this is a simulation where in the, on the bottom here, you see our uh, red ground truth neural activity. And on top is oops, in, uh, fMRI bold response, which we actually smooth. We, we sort of predict it more because we have fMRI, we have uh, bold. And we, the, the fMRI only doesn't get the shifts of the spikes, and image only sort of get both, both, but gets a little bit wrong, the bold response itself. And then uh, both of them get the timing correctly and get the bold response. And we've done ma massive experiments with different combinations of lags. And uh, the joint, joint analysis was better in uh, short, short lag area. And on density of neural activation, when we had a lot of stuff happening, they were not too much different, uh, fMRI only or fMRI plus MEG. Uh, an, a, an interesting thing, though, is that combined analysis, this is like for numerical reasons, but combined analysis, um, like what the picture shows is the variance of our estimator with number of particles that we used in the particle filter to estimate the model. And so you see the fall off of the variance. Of the, uh, uh, this was fMRI only, and this is fusion. So basically, you need fewer particles, and you're more computationally efficient if you use both modalities, because they constrain each other, and you don't get so much variance. <coughs> and the sa this is for bold response. This is for neural activity. And this is the real data experiment we collected. Uh, single subject checkerboard experiment data because we know, uh, our model is just one single ROI. It doesn't scale yet. Uh, so we know where the checkerboard uh, response is happening. It's a single ROI. And we collected image and fMRI. We interpolated the MRI, uh, fMRI to get the same sampling rates and basically used this data in, in our model. And Oh, the only difference with the uh, simulated experiments were those seven parameters. In simulated experiments, we didn't estimate them. We just set them to truth. Here, we didn't know what those hemodynamic model, forward model parameters are. And so if you use only fMRI, it perfectly tracks the true bold response or the average bold response. But it doesn't do well on the neural activity at all because uh, it can fit any any shape of the signal there by varying parameters, and that's what it actually does. And then MEG sort of MEG doesn't know about fMRI at all, so, so it just doesn't track it at all. Uh, and uh, like parameters of the hemodynamic model are not constrained by MEG. And when you do both, you get uh, fairly good tracking of the bold signal and the neural activity. Well. Uh, we don't know the ground truth, but we assume that it should be somewhere there where the checkerboard is shown and it agrees with what we're doing. Then, <coughs> yeah. Can we go back two slides? But, so I, I lost something. The, the neural activity, is this, this is simulated or is this actually measured? Oh, well, uh, notice that there is, no, there is no red line here. Uh, the, here, the red line is just the smoothed, uh, gr uh, averaged. No, I mean uh, the neural activity. Is that, you, I mean, you're not, you're not, I don't know you're what you're doing. Multiple electrodes. And, no, 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 so no. This is simulated. Or, or this is real data. Inverse. This is real data, but the blue is inverse. That's what yeah. the model okay. tells me. This is recovered neural activity. Recovered neural activity. Yes, I don't know what the true is, but I, uh, like, I can, I can. With high confidence, I, I think this is not the true neural activity. But these two, they're virtually indistinguishable. I wouldn't know. Uh, and one, one of the criticisms that you should raise is, well, why do you need fMRI at all for this? Right? I already get uh, good enough with MEG. But still, there are some differences. And we expect the differences when we do multi-ROI. That's where the spatial properties of fMRI. But we never got to it yet, hopefully. So um, one other question is, how can, how can you validate all of that when you don't have the ground truth? It's actually a good leading question to the next section that you ask. So 
we know the manipulation principle, we, we need to do interventions, break some parts, and so how can we break uh, parts in the brain without uh, subjects complaining? Uh, and so there is, one, uh, there is one way to do it, which is called non-invasive, but I was there in the lab uh, when it was sort of tried, and it is, it is non-invasive in a sense that you can walk out safely, and, but uh, it does have an effect. So it's transcranial direct current simulation. It's just a nine volt battery, right? And you have a, <laughs> and you have anode on your head, like a patch here, and a cathode somewhere on the arm. And when we were testing, there were burns, but then we figured out, uh, yeah. So you can get burns with a nine volt battery, apparently. Uh, I mean, so the, remember the same. Just to show you that it. It does something to the brain. The same, the same idea, the same picture. I'm, I'm repeating you the picture that I've shown you before, just to prime you to, uh, so you, you know how to interpret the next one. So this is the same, the same stuff. This is no degree. Uh, this is 30 minutes where subjects were just sitting in the EMG machine, and while subjects were sitting in the machine, in this 30 minutes, round two, the top subjects had electrical current applied for, it's like two milliamps or something for those 30 minutes. And the bottom subjects had something applied, but for a shorter duration of time and lower energy just to tickle them so there is no way, hopefully, to distinguish between these two conditions. And then each run is a 30 minute uh, run. So this is like after two hours from the start of the first application. And what we see here is that the networks of the people who had transcranial direct current stimulations applied, they have higher number of hubs. So you, you can say, well, the, the networks are more efficient now. They have denser connections. So the, uh, this is more like hitting the network with a hammer and instead of like intervening actually in a node. But at least uh, it shows the promise of the method that we, if we do use that hammer, it's, it is a hammer. It hits the network. Something happens, and it's detectable. So which I think if we explore the methods like that further, we, maybe this is a way of getting to ground truth, or at least getting to. And um, well, the, and this is just what we've done. Uh, there are tons of stuff to do. Uh, we've we were just basically trying and exploring what can be done when the ground truth is unknown. And a bigger problem for me is when the ROIs are unknown. And then the idea was uh, was just, well, can we, instead of doing with ROIs, can we combine the networks? We learn the networks on one modality and on another. And uh, that's how I reached out to David Danks, because he has done a lot of research into uh, combining experiments, uh, results of experiments. And I was like, look, you have this method that is easy to apply because I have the same condition. And so he started laughing at me. It's like, oh, they're, they're, not, they're not the same at all. They have different sampling rates. Forget, forget about the hemodynamics, slow, sluggishness, and smoothness. Just the sampling rates are so different that uh, we can't apply. And so now we got this NSF grant that we're working on our ideas. How do you, like, what do you do about when the sampling rates are different and you're measuring at the wrong sampling rate? And so, and so there is. So there's something I just completely missed. So first question, I have two questions. First question is, do you have a paper that gives more detail? Uh, on some of it. I'm sorry? On some of it, yes. I don't, OK, I don't have a paper on TDCS. This is like totally unpublished result. We don't know what to do with it. But uh, I have pap papers either written or published on the rest. Paper comes with a nine volt battery. <laughs> Good, I could use one. <laughs> uh, about this time of day. Uh, my second question is something I just don't understand. So you you do the EEG or the or the mag, yeah, and. Um, you get errors going one way. And you do the fMRI, and you get errors going the other way. Yes? Uh, so how can they both be true? Um, well, at least, at least in our undersampling um, investigations, we found that it's possible. If you, you can simulate under sampling condition. You don't simulate what really fMRI is doing to your signal. But if you start dropping your samples, 
and get from milliseconds sampling rate to two seconds sampling rate, you see this effect. No, Reversals and things like that. I, I believe you see the statistical effect. But I'm asking how the world can work so that I get a causal direction this way from a bunch of causal directions going that way. I mean, I, I don't understand what the picture is of the world. <laughs> Oops. Well, this is our next paper, right? But we know how it's possible. It is possible. Through the loops, through interactions, and things like that. So, so just think about a loop, right? If you caught it at the wrong sampling rate, your loop totally reverses. It's a temporal. Te a lot, yeah, a lot effect. <laughs> Well, this project was on accelerated learning for DARPA, and that's what they're trying to do, make soldiers learn faster. Uh -huh. So it's like, you need help, but you need the battery hooked up. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a car battery. Carbon 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 yeah. Can you talk more about the dynamic phase network and fitting things with the SMC? There must be more details about how well this is working for you and how well this is running. It's that. not working that well, otherwise we would have scaled it up already to multiple ROIs. Uh, there were multiple hurdles and difficulties with the... The first thought was, like, par particle filters, what could be better? Like, I mean, it's simple, I just cut it up, or I just take off the shelf implementation and run it. But then, hemodynamic forward model is a differential equation. It's self a dynamic Bayesian network of, of some sort, and we didn't treat it as part of our model, we tr treated it uh, differently, and then the tons of divergence issues. Like our, our solvers will diverge, like if, even if you do Euler or anything simple, like they, they would diverge and stuff like that. But finally we got it working, but then we don't know how it scales because, the, the, how to scale it because number of particles is exponential and the number of hidden um, states, hidden, hidden, but hopefully. But there was a question there. So first question is, uh, the study you're doing with children and brain stimulation, uh, how many children? I'm not doing anything with children, no. <laughs> those, are, those are where on adult uh, subjects, got, um, sort of. Uh, children, no, children. Yeah, the charts had children in it. Number of children. No, that's children. Oh, children is the, the graphical terminology. <laughs> the, okay. <laughs> children in the graph. <laughs> How long did you torture them? <laughs> oh, but uh, is it? Oh, no, no, but the, the, no, 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 it, it is here. It is here. I mean, the. Yeah. It's when you have to Those are the graphical children. Imaginary children. Did you see a study that we never had any cases on burns? Say it again? We've been doing a lot of brain stimulation. But on never, kids? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but we never had any, any burns. So if you want to participate, anyone, let us know. <laughs> oh, no, we didn't have any burns on participating subjects. No, I'm giving you internal information, which no one knows. And I may be wrong. So you can't quote me for that. And our nine volt battery cost us five thousand dollars. Well, that dep depends on who you go with. We, we made our systems. We built our systems ourselves. I mean, I didn't do that, but we had grad students who actually oh, built them. Burns. That's why we had who had burns in the beginning. But when we built them, they worked, and we were kind of we knew what's inside and what we were paying for. Probably cost more for a grad student salary, but that's better. <laughs> uh, there was a question. I, I have also a question. I think I might, I might have missed something before you, so I just wanted to check. It sounded like in the middle you were describing how the difference between the mega and the fMRI data might look was from uh, on the on the fMRI data all you're picking up is activity, right? The the, the the number of the amount of oxygen going through a region, right, which represents how much neural firing I think is happening. And an EMG is the same. Well, is the EMG the same? Because I thought you were suggesting that there might be some reorganization of the network happening before there was activity spikes. 
and then what you're seeing from the MIG was... Well, I, I mean, GA sort of picks, coherent, uh, uh, picks up coherent activity as well. It's like when all neurons in a patch, it doesn't go to the single neuron level, but when all neurons in a patch start firing one direction. You could have two regions which have the same activity, but one would actually be coherent in firing all together, one would not, and, and the MIG would pick that up to the Yes, yes. The, the, yeah, if MEG, in MEG it would be cancelling. Like if you have different signs in MEG, you wouldn't see that activity. So you would see a difference between coherent and incoherent regions, even though the activity would be the same. Yes. Okay, so activity in a sort of in metabolic That's rate. Right. Yes. If so you depending on what you measure, activity. Is that part of what you're suggesting? Is, is explaining the difference between what we're getting from the MEG and fMRI? That is part that I'm skipping. There, I, I think there are multiple ways how why we could see the difference, but we're focusing the, um, on one that the sampling rates are different. Just having the sampling rate different can can hurt or change those directions a lot. Just that alone. And if you add on top other things which are there, but I just don't know how to can, handle all of them simultaneously. Yeah. Uh, so I think you made a comment. In terms of the fusion business, you made a comment about you wouldn't really recommend seeding the MEG solution with the variety of activity. Did you say that? Mm, did you say that? Mm, Good. <laughs> Second question. So in all the talks so far, everybody has been trying, giving the impression that bold is very sluggish. It's actually not very sluggish. In fact, and the, the human attitude response is often picked out as a criminal in all this Well, first off, there isn't a human attitude response. Okay? There's, there's a response, but the actual identification of that function is not known. Nobody knows that it's with gamma, you know, envelopes or stuff we use. It's just all nonsense. Okay? So no one should use it. But we do. And we do the analysis. I, I can't personally stop the river from doing this. But if you measure the onset, so the first derivative of that function, that you know, that's happening within hundreds of milliseconds. And people have used that actually to measure uh, and correlate very strongly with reaction time and other sort of perceptual events that are happening in milliseconds. You look at uh, Lu Luis Pessoa has done some base mast uh, designs down to 50 milliseconds using fMRI. So this was another discussion years ago I had with Clark and Joe. The, the sampling rate business is really confusing because the standard researcher is treating fMRI as though it has this higher sampling rate. And I, I've never got it. It seems to me like a, a serious problem that somebody actually needs to figure out. Why can you get such good results with fMRI in these paradigms where you've got very, very short durations, like down to literally 30 milliseconds. Rod, Rodney Mann has done experiments at 30 milliseconds. And got, uh, pretty, so how, you know, and it does seem like the various causality methods, like Imagine, so seem to be able to detect these very fine differences in some of our paradigms, or like that condition that takes paradigm. Makes no sense to me. I can't make any sense of it. I don't understand why it works, but it seems to work. And this contrast that you're making, you make it, and fMRI is an important place, I think, to try to figure that out. And so that's what I'm saying. The full response is more complicated than a three-second, you know, box card or, or, or you know, sort of you know, line mobile function. It's, 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 that's not what it is. It's just more data. It means that you get a detection response that, in terms of psychophysical function, from this task using fMRI. So you can actually see the probability of detection go up as you add more ROIs from fMRI. And it's doing it within, you get a 50 millisecond stimulus, someone's smiling, you get a neutral mask, and then your job is to basically uh, report, did you see someone smiling? At that level, <clears throat> you shouldn't, that sampling room shouldn't support this experiment. So well, it's published, they did it. <laughs> so well, how so is it by work? just, you have a, a lot of repeated mm -hmm. measurements of, with a shifted sampling, right? Uh, Say again. Is it, how, how did they do that? If you collect, so, so your sampling rate is... It's a trial. But yeah, it's trial based. It's a lot of averaging with a shift probably, right? The relative shift of this two seconds. So you can like... You could be doing an event rate generator. But that's not, that doesn't solve the basic sampling rate problem, right? 
that all that would do is no, it does so you because you're you're you know, assuming the same response across all of your uh, presentations, and if it is the same, then you can kind of you're still sampling at the lower rate, though. I mean, you've still got a human record, so so, so it's, it's not oxygen. But it's like it, it, it sounds it, like a wonderful topic to discuss yeah, over lunch. <laughs>